happy, happy, happy. Got nothing to do? Wanna have some fun? Hey, 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 hey. What's in Dad's basement? Like many mouths, consume its body from all sides. No one is it. Hey kids, it's been a long time, uh, a lot has happened. When I last left off I was making videos to highlight the qualities of Eternal Darkness, the game, to support a Kickstarter for a follow-up to the game that was being produced by a company at the time. Uh, it's two years later, obviously, that Kickstarter didn't go. Um, but uh, at the time, when I made those videos, I was trying to put out a perspective that really just focused on the original game. Uh, put it in a context uh, in the first video of Lovecraftian fiction and games. And then, secondly, to just look at the game all by itself, by its own merits. Having spent the first two videos not really considering press or, or PR or, or the audience response, in any way but the most, uh, you know, cursory glance. Uh, part 3 was originally designed just to look at the Kickstarter and what it had to offer. But now that it's a, a posthumous uh, uh, survey of the story of, of uh, the Kickstarter of Shadow of the Eternals, we very much have to look at the press response to the first game the press response to Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem. Technopoly by Neil Postman. To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a man with a computer, everything looks like data. And to a man with a grade sheet, everything looks like a number. So I've been a fan of games press ever since I was a fan of games. Early on, that took the form of magazines. We all got subscriptions to magazines if we wanted, or bought them off the newsstand uh, in order to catch up on all the news in our games. And that started to change uh, right around uh, after or during the time of the release of Eternal Darkness, uh, really at the, the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, really a lot of that began to shift into a new entity uh, online. Uh, and there you would find really the nascent birth of, of some new forms of covering video games uh, or new forms really of conveying or transmitting uh, a familiar old media in the terms of audio and video. And here we've got oh, some of the planet Cube Cube King. There's Madman Max Lake. Hello. I am Matt. There's hey. our buddy Ed. J Dub. Yeah. And, and Billy P. Just <laughs> We're just sharing the love here at Planet GameCube. Yep. This is uh, Dennis Dyag and Planet GameCube. Hi, Dennis. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. All right, we'll just uh, here's which, the whole which game. Which cameras do I look at? <laughs> we'll, we'll get set up here. You have matter. two faces, right? <laughs> we're not good at PR. Okay, if you want PR, don't come to me. Um, we're. I think we're good at making video games. All we want to do is make games. We just want to make games. Hi, everyone. My name is Dennis Dyack. Uh, the demo um, of the specs and the layout, they were in utter shock. I can't believe this, it is so good. What really excites us about the machine is um, how easy we feel it's going to be to work with. The new technology is designed by people that understand games. This is games hardware brought to us by games companies. I think Sony has given everyone a chisel, and they can create this piece of artwork with a chisel. If you make one mistake, you can't erase that mistake. Where the Nintendo is like a pencil, where you can go through, create your world. If you make mistakes, it's easy to go back and optimize things the way you need to optimize them. People are going to be able to focus on creating the game rather than, you know, struggling with the hardware. So are you guys all recording everything? Uh, yeah, now. I think we are. I mean, this okay. is, you know, recording. I was going to date this. What is today's date? Today is <laughs> the 18th? 18th? Yeah. That's our free OSD. I'm probably going to cut it off halfway because I need to do another interview, but you know. At uh, E3 2001. Pushing more polygons is important, but what they've really done is optimize the system 
to make the best video game performance rather than the best polygon performance. We're telling stories like we've never told before. Um, all of the ideas that uh, uh, we really wanted to, to convey, we can do this with the new technology. Uh, in the face of the GameCube, um, I think it's pretty clear here in the show uh, that Nintendo, is, uh, with this system, uh, is really going to dominate the next generation. And what I think the, game, what the GameCube does is it's really going to change the, uh, uh, generally, see the people who produce great stories, great content, really start to come to the forefront. And I think it's a time where um, the people who really create great games are really interested in it. The machine is so capable. Um, we are able to very closely deliver what we really want to show the players. You know, it's wonderful for our designers. Back in, I'm a, I'm a big historical buff, um, and I like to study history, and I think what we're seeing here now uh, is history repeat itself. If you, if, you look at, if you look at the game and uh, the film industry in the 1930s, the people who dominated the film industry were people who, um, who could cut the tape the best, who did all the tricks with the wires the best. These are the type of people who um, had people flying around on wires and people go, wow, look what they can do with film. Those people dominated the film industry. Then, around 1940s, 1950s, 50s, something happened. And what happened was um, the camera became standardized. And all of a sudden, all these editing techniques became available to everyone. So tools were invented, people could splice, people could cut, put sound in just like everyone else. The graphics people saw how the technology guys were and started talking to them and said, so what does this mean we can do? And then when they found out, their eyes lit up and you could just see them starting to drain. Then what happened is a, an industry paradigm change occurred and the people who used to dominate with the tricks went away and the people who used to be able to write the good stories began to dominate and those people are still here today. Those people like MGM, Universal, all those players are still alive today. We're gonna create these worlds that are just gonna blow people away. But sometimes it just doesn't happen. And I can only apologize. Eternal Darkness, um, it's, it's one of those, Eternal Darkness is one of those games where we look at it and just, you know, are very, very happy with it. I've, we've never had a game before where there's been so much industry acclaim where people still come up to us and go, man, Eternal Darkness, we want to do something like that someday. It's nice. I'm Dennis Dyack from Silicon Knights. I'm the director of this project. Uh, helping me uh, show this is Jeff Kalis from Nintendo of America. Um, and what, what we're going to focus on uh, in, this, in this video clip um, that we're doing is uh, Alex Royboss. Um, she is uh, the main character in the game. Oh, look, it's Syndra. I knew your ears must have been burning. So, you know, being girls who play games and probably, as, as Megan mentioned, had to play a lot of male protagonists, um, you know, how does that, I guess, affect your experience? And, and do you feel that, that there are plenty of good female role models out there? The characters like... Jill Valentine or Heather Mason from Silent Hill. These are real realistic female characters kind of thrown into unrealistic situations and they handle them probably like any one of us would. Uh, very uh, like a normal person and uh, not over-sexualized, not uh, relying on, you know, uh, on you know, female stereotypes by any means. And uh, that's why they make good characters, good female characters. So what have you been making? Do you have any uh, positive or negative examples? Uh, she brought up quite a bit uh, that were they were good. There's a Eternal Darkness, Sanity's oh, Requiem, perfect. which has Alex Roivas. Is her last? It's been a while. Yes. I think it's Roivas. Yes, it yeah. is. And uh, she's awesome. I mean, she's she's freaked out by what's going on, but she holds it together, and she's like the she's the main character. She's the one who like binds the entire story together. Mm -hmm. And there's a few others um, in the game too. A few other, it's just I don't remember. There's at least one other female character that's in the game, mm -hmm. and um, 
she was like a, a pretty strong character as well and it was a really good game and the fact that the female character was like the main one she's the one who's discovering all this stuff mm-hmm. was was really really cool and uh, and I actually didn't realize this until like watching a, a video recently of Jennifer Hale's voice work, but Jennifer Hale was Alex Royvis. Ah, no way. I didn't know that either. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> wow. In the Citadel's halls, inside the shining walls, hear the stories from Earth. Fighters want to prove their worth. Uh, Eternal Darkness has been, <laughs> was at E399. It was at... It was here last year at E3 2000. Yes. And now it's here this year at E3 2001. Um, technically, how long has Eternal Darkness, um, from like early conception throughout development, how long has that, has that been? Well, we, we are, are actually not talking about the length of development time for our products. Uh, we, we, that's just uh, stuff, something we stay away from. Um, we have not removed anything uh, by bringing uh, Eternal Darkness to the GameCube. We've added substantial portions. And uh, if anything, the game is much bigger. The vision of the game is much more fulfilled. And um, we really think it was good. Um, you know, I wish that some stances, or some circumstances, that maybe we wouldn't show the sort of as much. Um, I really think the strategy that uh, Yamauchi san uh, has done from the beginning since Space World has been extremely effective. So that period of silence can be very effective for marketing. We're. we're um, really not into doing too much media. I've said some things out there that I shouldn't have said in the press about this project and other projects, and I apologize for that. I'm sorry. I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson so much that I am not making business decisions like that, like putting more money into a project than what we're getting paid. I am focusing on the creative. One of my favorite publications was EGM, Electronic Gaming Monthly, uh, which was something that uh, I subscribed to for a number of years uh, and for a number of issues and read uh, rather religiously. Do you play video games? Call and power up with EGM, Electronic Gaming Monthly. Get cool reviews, secret codes, tips, game maps, and previews like American Sammy's Wanderers from Ease. Thrilling adventure and graphics for play on Super NES. EGM, excellent. This excellent TV offer is only available by calling 800-8-GAMERS. Get four issues of EGM plus one of these guides and this tips book free. Pay by check or pay by credit card now and get a bonus tip sheet free. Call 800-8-GAMERS, that's 800-8-GAMERS. And as a reader of these publications, you got to know the uh, personalities and opinions of the people who worked for them and wrote for them. Uh, EGM's own online outlet was launched as Gamer.com and eventually rebranded as OneUp.com. The OneUp network was very well known for its podcasts that it had, uh, and I listened to many of these religiously as well. OneUp Yours, uh, which was later rebranded, Four Guys, OneUp, and a number of other brands, uh, as well as Retronauts, which covered a lot of the classic uh, video game series and releases, which was to my interest, being that I'm sort of a person who has been there from the very beginning myself. This week on Retronauts, we talk about survival horror. Eek! Okay, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Perfect. Welcome to Retronauts Welcome for the week of what the f- is it? Eight sixteen. August something. Yes. Yeah. That. Um, I'm Scott Sharkey. Yeah. But, yeah. It, 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 you, you think maybe they're just doing that, it as like a switch? As in you thought this was going to happen? Sending it for Jeremy Parrish. Hi, this is Shane Bettenhausen, executive editor of Electronic Gaming Monthly. Wow. You're executive editor now? I am. The world of gamers journalism has changed so much, you know, since I started back in 2000. And, you know, I was there for a lot of it. And things such as podcasts and video shows and blogs and, you know, Twitter, all these things kind of you know, came to prominence while I was doing it. And it was cool to be able to see that happen and adapt with it and experience all those changes. But at the same time, it's kind of, you know, changed the field. I don't know if the things I loved about games journalism are all still there. I'm Chris Kohler from Wired, uh, trying to suppress my latent hate towards Jen Frank, as all the internet thinks that I have. Here we are. I'm actually holding uh, one of the ET cartridges that was pulled out of the landfill. And Jen Frank is going to introduce herself, even though she didn't come into this podcast until halfway through. What oh, right. latent hate? 
That's what that's what Gaff says that we all uh, are, are just. <gasps> oh right. Oh, just, sorry. We're like, we're like because Gaff doesn't barely. know that I hang out with these guys in my free time and we go have dinner. No, we go we get ice cream. Games what is and, this Gaff of which you speak? To? Oh yeah, dude. Shane Bettenhausen knows nothing of the way. Whatever. Gaff. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> He's what never is that? Gaff. What is that? But apparently, there's a whole lot of dudes. It's just our dynamic. They wouldn't get away with it if I didn't let them. Ah, you're that so lethal. You think. What? Get the f*** out. <laughs> this is Jen Frank. F*** you. Okay, finally. So I can already see how this is going to end, which is badly. Uh... <laughs> and that's our introduction. Spirited. Wasn't that special? Well, what are my good I, moments? The bathtub scene in Eternal Darkness. <laughs> you I, see, I haven't oh, played, right. I haven't oh, played okay. Eternal Darkness, but I'd, I'd like to hear what you think about it. because. A lot, a lot of people say it just rips off Lovecraft, you know, wholesale. Of course it does, it does. but it's, it, yeah. but it does it well, you know, and it's right. not ashamed of it or anything. Yeah, it's also public domain. I mean, you know, right. they can do whatever they they want with it, and they give credit to him in the, you know, in the game itself. No, you find his books on the shelves in the game, and exactly. it's just, you know, it's it, more it, of an homage. I, I hate I saying that, but say it actually is. Homage. You know, it's I mean, one of the cases where that you you can totally say that, right? Truthfully, I mean, you can say maybe they took a little too, you know, freely, maybe a little too much, uh, but at the same time, like. It, it was done so well. It was done really, really well. And it was one of the only games, and I, Sharky and I just recently found out we have this in common, that I don't I don't replay games. I play through a yeah. game, maybe I finish it, but then that's pretty much well, it. But it has multiple endings. Yeah, that's, Eternal that's, Darkness, that's, I played to do it. Well, that it fundamentally changes the, the gameplay depending on which one you're going through. And then you get one big final cutscene at the end. And so it comes to pass. Of the three ancients, there is nothing. Mighty Chaturga has obliterated the insanity of Zelotath. The madness of Zelotath has overcome the power of Uliath. The boundless Uliath has decimated the power of Chaturga. All at once, separate and simultaneous. For the universe is made of many time streams, many possibilities all in harmonious synchronicity. Only Mantarok remains, slowly dying. Mantarok, keeper, overseer, warden of ancients, chaos, an entity trapped between the veils of reality and the enchanted stakes that impale its flesh. Unable to rally its guardians, it could rely only on its subtle manipulations of the Roivas family to destroy its enemies. Knowing the nature of the ancients, it used its pawns to play them against each other, resulting in their mutual annihilation. Now it will languish forever, festering in its tomb, plotting. And I played through that game three times to get everything, and I had a ball. I mean, I thought it was... I thought it was yeah, it wasn't any less enjoyable. Game. I mean, they changed the cutscenes up, the way the enemies acted, the different kinds of enemies you encounter changed, right. depending, you know, it was. It, they added a lot to it. And they did a lot of work with controls. Like, Resident Evil had always put me off because I just hated the controls. So with Eternal Darkness working with Miyamoto-san, we really, really were allowed to hone our gameplay and really work with Miyamoto-san very, very tightly. You know, Henry Sturchy as well, who is producer on the project. Now he's, he's joined us at Silicon Knights and also working on To Human. Um, you know, we are working together to do things at, at a very, very deep level. But one of the things uh, which may not have been immediately apparent in the demo is when you squeeze the lock button, you know how you can click? If you hold the analog down and just click and not let it go, you actually cycle through the enemies in order. So you can actually, with, with the shifters, do different things. Um, this, is that kind of like the uh, Z triggering um, with, uh, with the Z targeting with Zelda? Yeah, it's similar to that. Um, however, it's it's a it's a it's a bit more subtle, I guess. Um, that was um, that was a technique that we've just recently done, and it seems to really work. It's something you're not you know we're not we didn't explain on the show floor, but it's when you pick up the game and play it. Uh, it's really important that people know what enemy they're targeting. That's a real problem with uh, some other you know, games uh, when enemies are coming at the screen. When you're in third person, targeting can be very difficult. And uh, what, what I found very interesting is um, by highlighting the body parts, 
Um, we thought we had shown that before, and I, I'm just, I thought we had, but apparently we hadn't. Um, and no, actually people, you didn't, because you showed me yesterday how to do that. Yeah, Very and cool. uh, that was a surprise for us. We didn't know that that was going to be a big deal. And people went, wow, you can target body parts? We're like, last year you could target, but they didn't highlight. Yeah, okay. You can literally lop off someone's head, everybody's going to go, ooh, that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> what we're going to show here is the sanity system. You'll see, you'll see here in Eternal Darkness, the number of polygons for a character is actually higher than the entire polygons for an entire refresh on the N64. Uh, a lot of people may think we may have simply converted this. That's not true. We, are at, we actually wrote the code from scratch, and this is using a subset of the T-Human engine. Uh, the GameCube allows us to do 24 bits per second, 640 by 480, always maintaining 60 frames per second. As Jeff moves through the game here, he'll be able to show you the targeting system where you can highlight different body parts. So if he wants to shoot off the head here, he just selects the head, fires and shoots. And you can also take out the torso if he wants to. So the whole, the whole philosophy of no camera control, and I know there's some hardcore gamers that say, I want to control the camera all the time, but bottom line is, uh, from our perspective, when I used to play Pac-Man, or uh, maybe not, maybe Defender, it's more hardcore, it makes me... <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but when you used to play those games that were in 2D, you never had to worry about the camera. And then when Miyamoto-san came out with Mario 64, or, um, you know, uh, Tomb Raider came out, suddenly there was this evolution and everything changed. It was like, wow, we have these awesome 3D environments, but then suddenly we're controlling the camera and doing combat. We without knowing it, introduce this layer of complexity where people started saying, I can't play that game, it's too hard. What we're going to show now is we're going to show the intelligent camera system. This is just a really small part of what we can do. Uh, Jeff is just going to basically crush this guy pretty quickly and be able to finish him off. Um, one of the things I want you to pay attention to now, though, is watch the cameras as Jeff walks around the room. Notice the detail again in the pages. Actually, with the zoom up, you can actually see the writing on the pages. But look at the cameras. What we really, this camera is optimized for is for fighting, to make sure that nothing's in the way, that you can look at the enemy at all times, and that you have a good perspective of the room. But now that the enemy's dead, uh, Jeff can leave the room, come back in. Now watch the cameras. There we go, we're flying through the rafters. And so what we're trying to do by doing, you know, creating an intelligent camera system is removing that layer of complexity so you don't have to worry about the camera. If you don't notice the camera, it's the best thing in the world. And when we released Eternal Darkness, our biggest fear was the camera. And we had no one say anything negative. And it was, it was for us, it was an epiphany. That was something that always pissed me off just because every time you talk to people at Capcom about this, uh -huh. it's like, my guy controls like a fucking tank. Why did you take the sidestep move out? That was great. Right. And they're like, well, because the bad controls make it scary. Yeah. It's like, well, you, 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 cutting off my thumbs would make it scary. I, I would say that to him, but I don't want to give him any fucking ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I totally understand that. And I mean, I think they're, I, I see where they're coming from. And I understand that in, in, in context, it can be that, that way. But I mean, Eternal Darkness was uh, maybe l less scary than Resident Evil was, but at the same time, it was way more fun. You know, it didn't just yeah. constantly beat on you with these bad No, it, even even when it was trying to freak you out, it was, it was entertaining. Now, what we're going to do, uh, what we really want to do here is show you the sanity system. And the way the sanity system works is, as you see enemies, your sanity starts to drop. A lot of people might think Eternal Darkness is a survival horror game, but actually it's not. Um, we actually are taking the opposite approach with the sanity system. So, in, in, as an example, in Resident Evil, which is one of the classic survival horror games, you're not given enough bullets and you have to run away from the enemies. But what we do in this game is actually, every time you see an enemy, your sanity will drop. The only way to get it back is to kill them and to sort of regain some confidence. So if you run through the game and don't kill any enemies, you'll actually go insane and die. You know, like I played through the entire game and my sanity meter just bottomed right the hell out. Just right. that every time I entered a room, something stupid would happen. And I loved well, it. But one of the big complaints is in that game, in order to see the fun insanity effects, you have to play the game poorly. And like, that's yeah. ostensibly the well, most fun part of the yeah. game. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's something you can complain about. But I mean, right. go ahead, play but the game again, poorly. Those, I, I enjoyed that. The sanity effects were hyped up, but they weren't really a huge part of the game. The game was fine without right. the sanity effects. They were just sort of a little bonus. Yeah, And I mean, yeah, I, I think that if they had been given the chance to do a sequel, they probably would have gone about it in a different way after finding that out. That's one of those things that sometimes you make a good video game and there's something that's a little off and you get the chance to fix it, but they just didn't, never got the chance to go and, and fix it. But at the same time, some of the sanity effects were, I mean, I, I feel like I play the game well and I saw a lot of the sanity effects.
one of the best ones was just a bug would crawl across your TV screen. Oh, yeah. And then it would never tell you, like, oh, that was a sanity effect. You just no, it like, just sort oh, of happened. Shit, there's a spider in the room, and you, like, pause the game and go looking for it. We're kind of going nuts on Eternal Darkness, but I do have to say, I was talking to Dennis Dyack, the guy at Silicon Knights, mm-hmm. and one of the insanity effects, apparently, it makes your memory card seem like it's erased. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, no, it says, like, deleting save file. Right. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. getting that through Nintendo, NLA, right. was, like, the biggest oh, like, deal of it. all time. Like, they didn't yep. understand why that was funny, or, like, like they thought it was cruel. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. They're supposed to be cruel. This yeah. this game was essentially like three hours of the yep. Psycho Mantis fight, really. There was one sanity effect where you'd walk into a room and your head falls off. Oh, yeah, and, and you pick it up and it starts reciting. It up an item and it looks like, yeah, and it's like... Uh, Shakespeare. I think yeah, it does the poor Yorick poor bit. Yorick, right. Yeah. And, then, oh. and then it, yeah. Oh, some of it was just... They were cute. The one where you just were, like sink through the floor, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see or more, the, the, or a blue screen of death came up, which was adorable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually surprised no one else has really ripped that off. It is a good concept and no one else has done it, really. Well, besides what Kojima or whatever, and that wouldn't be a ripoff. It would be, you know, what just fucking with people for the sake of fucking with them. Yeah, no, it's like the Andy Kaufman school of game design. I love, I love that idea. Right, and I, I hope they would actually do that. Don't worry, it's a game. It's a game just like usual. You'll ruin your eyes playing so close to the TV. What are you talking about? Honestly, though, you have played the game for a long time. Don't you have anything else to do with your time? Hi everyone, you're listening to Dennis Dyack on EGM Live. Greetings and salutations. You're listening to a very special episode of EGM Live from March 12th, 2007. I am uh, EGM Executive Editor Shane Bettenhausen, and I have some very special guests here in the studio with me today. We have Brian Intahar. I'm definitely not special, but thank you for having me. He's the, uh, the previews editor, that's right, of yes. Electronic Game Monthly. We also have... The illustrious Mark McDonald. I uh, was slightly special because I'm not always here. <laughs> he's kind of sp- special in a special way. Uh, he's the director of GameVideos.com. That's right. And our very, very special guest, kind of like a special episode of Blossom, is uh, <laughs> the CEO, Lord, and like uh, king oh. of Silicon Knights, hey Mr. Dennis Dyack. I underestimated, uh, I guess, the advance of technology on the internet. Today on the internet... People just link and relink and link and relink. Every time that it was linked, it got this incremental shred of credibility. And the level of which people thought it was real was not made apparent until we started trying to do fundraising when it became, became overwhelmingly obvious from everyone here at Precursor, all of uh, our fans trying to get this game promoted, that they continued to run into this wall. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. We're very happy to have you. We're very excited to finally get me, you, and Mark all here at the same table to talk about Two Human. Highest rated EGM Live ever. I'm going to make that prediction right now. Not even knowing what's going to happen, what we're going to say. Yeah. Highest rated EGM live ever. It's so thanks, be for being, thanks for being here. And uh, we have Reverend Dennis himself come up with something really difficult that you won't be able just to go to like his Wikipedia entry and find, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, what do you got that's a real stumper for these kids? I, 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 would, I would, if I was to guess one quick question off the top of my head, it would be uh, there's always a question in eternal darkness of was there another ancient one that wasn't a fourth one, am I right? Was there three? And this will be a, a fifth one. A fifth one, okay. Yes, and the answer is yes, there was. Who? What, what? What was the color of that alignment? Wow. So yeah, please leave your entries at our 1UP Club at EGM Live hyphen 
club.oneup.com and we'll pick a winner <laughs> next week. Jen actually wrote that out for me in all words and like it's felt, it sounds really weird. So I'll let me read that again. It's like www <laughs> yeah. spelled out. Easy alive hyphen club.oneup.com and we'll pick a winner next week. And uh, we can't thank you enough, Dennis, for coming and doing this. It was the most epic, heated, tumultuous. No, like everything EGM aside, it's ever. Not, you don't. You don't have to 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 come here and uh, and face the music. I think I face the music as well. But I mean, uh, I think it's cool uh, that you're that you're uh, upfront and honest, and we definitely appreciate you coming by. And the whole situation is unfair to everyone. And, and if I didn't, if I came across too harshly, I apologize. And, no, and, nothing, uh, nothing at all to uh, to apologize for. All right. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. See you later, kids. All right, now um, from last week, uh, March twelfth podcast. This was the question that Dennis Dyack asked, right? Yes. W- what was that question, Shane? Uh, in Eternal Darkness, there are these different types of, of <gasps> magic, with different colors, and there was a there was one that didn't make it into the game, but they had designed it, and he basically asked what it was, and it was the opposite of one of the other colors in the game, and it was he said it'd be very difficult to understand, but apparently okay. a lot of people did figure it out. You want to read this answer and then th- tell me if it makes <coughs> sense know, to you. Either. Who's going to pronounce these words? You know how to pronounce these words? I don't know. I'll do what I can. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not so good on the uh, Lovecraftian stuff here. <coughs> so this is by Nicola Nomali. Also, Ki- her name is Kishi from Florida. She writes, Yeah, it's yellow. Everything magical in Eternal Darkness, from the items you collect to aspects of the scenery, is tied to a color that represents one of the four ancients in the story. Red for Charuga. <laughs> Blue for Uyalov. Good, good. <laughs> Green for Ziltorach. <laughs> and purple for Mantorok. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. But when there's something that's not aligned towards any of the ancients, it's represented as yellow. Fans initially took this to mean that yellow is just a color for neutrality, but then they began to hip- hypothesize that it could just as easily symbolize a yet un- unidentified fifth ancient. This view was later corroborated by Dennis himself in various interviews. Of course, anyone who wants to, t- anyone who is so desperate to discuss the finer points of Eternal Darkness that he'd slum around the GameFAQs message boards back in 2002 and 2003 would know this. Okay, you're not a, you're not a girl. Uh, and you're a dude. And uh, congratulations, that's the right answer. Welcome, everybody, to day three of the special GDC One Up Yours podcast. And now I have a cast of five here with me. This is Garnet Lee. And across from me is Shane Bettenhausen, executive editor for the video game section of the One Up Network, Sean Elliott who is the executive editor for the PC segment of the 1UP Network. Brian Intahar, who is the, what did we call him earlier? The Preview Preview czar. czar, or senior editor for previews on the 1UP Network. Dennis Dyack, master of the entire Silicon Knights empire, a.k.a. CEO, and live in San Francisco by special engagement from, direct from Tokyo. Legendary vagabond, Mark McDonald. <laughs> uh, Marcus Aurelius Foxworthy Goldblum Jesus McClure McDonald the third. Marcus Aurelius Foxworthy Goldblum Jesus McClure McDonald the third. Confirmed. Releasing security enforcement. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing, and it's, it's, it's not really clear in what we're showing here, but all of the enemies in um, none of which we've shown to the public at all. Um, I, I really hope that people think that it's going to be mostly zombies because they're really underestimating just as much as just as much as they've underestimated the GameCube. Um, which, which I still owe Dennis like, b- like big apologies and ups for because the first time I ever met him was at E3 and I was, uh, it was, so it was the E3 that the GameCube was unveiled and they were showing ED on the floor and I was shooting my mouth off in front of one of the displays and this person taps me on the shoulders and he goes, so you just think it's a crappy Resident Evil club with a dude with a shotgun killing zombies. <laughs> <laughs> and that was you. Was it me? It was you. I can't believe I could st- stand up and say something like that. <laughs> I can't believe you'd say that either. Yeah, I can't <laughs> believe you, Dennis, of all people, would go after would go somebody def- for being with- critical of your work. <laughs> <laughs> and he proceeded to totally shoot me down. And then I played ED and I was like, this fucking game is amazing and I loved it. And, oh, thanks. And, well, so and he- I felt like a complete jerk for a long time. You should <laughs> Shouldn't, you shouldn't because your job is to be a critic. And that was not being a critic, dude. That was just being a dick. That was me. Come on. That was me looking at a game with a dude with a shotgun and zombies and being a dick. You're not the only one, so you need to understand you were probably one of 5,000 people at E3 that were going, ah, another Resident Evil. And at some point, with you know the constant interviews, you break and you're just like, ah, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right.
I wish I could go back in time and change my tone, and I wish I could go back in time and change what I said to you. Um, nah. Yeah, well, that, was, that was hilarious. And also, <laughs> being a hothead myself, I'd be, look, I'm a creative guy who also takes things incredibly too personal, as everybody on NeoGAF yeah. also does. So I totally vibe to the whole, like, really? Shut the f*** up, punk. <laughs> the tone could have been a lot better. I think there was a tendency and a bias in our industry that said, you know, Eternal Darkness was exactly like Resident Evil. And many people who, who haven't played Eternal Darkness think it is like Resident Evil. And clearly, it's, I don't think that could be farther from the truth. And in some sense, um, you know, survival horror um, has really, um, and I think it's been great for the industry, obviously big influence on me. I love, I love the Resident Evil games. Uh, but I think it's, 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 it's sort of niched the horror market in such a way that it really needs to be changed. I think with Eternal Darkness as an example, it was for people people who played the game really, really liked it, but you had to give it time and had to play the first three or four levels before the game really came into its own. You know, retrospective's 2020, and, and you can look at something and criticize, say, I, I really wish we could have done these things better. Like for me, Eternal Darkness, I look back, and the fact that the magic system, by running around the circle, the magic would come back, that's that was my most hated thing about that game. Mm. I really don't like that economy of, of the magic and the sanity and, and the health. And we had ideas. We had more ideas for it. It's just time. Yeah. And, yep. you know, you just have to release it. I think Eternal Darkness to us is kind of like a foreign film. And it got, you know, they get tremendous critical acclaim in something like, um, to me, like, say, Million Dollar Baby, which is in, an incredible movie. Um, but really, you know, doesn't, hit that Lord of the Rings numbers. But overall, you know, um, you know, certainly didn't do poorly, it just didn't, we hoped it would sell millions and millions. Eternal Darkness for me was, it was kind of like our Blade Runner. And Blade Runner influenced so many things, influenced the industry. I still have people coming up, developers saying Eternal Darkness is one of my best games of all times. You know, are my favorite games of all time. And you know, at the end of the day, how many numbers did it do? Yeah. And like, the, the legacy of like the ins the insanity effects. Yes. I mean, people still talk about that. Developers mm -hmm. still right. talk about that. You know, it's it was a it's a, a pretty big moment. Yeah, but you know, just like Blade Runner, how it all this sort of dark future stuff really influenced science fiction. Blade Runner did not do well at the box office. No. So Dennis, have you had time for anything that wasn't a Silicon Knights product? Yeah, you know, Sins of the Solar <laughs> Empire. I, there's so many things I like about that game, and. Um, that reminds me of a game that we would have made back when we were make, working on the PC. It's got this sort of epic feel. It's kind of like, um, you know, Galactic Civilization meets Homeworld, which I love Galactic Civilization. And I've got to say, that game sort of almost came out of nowhere. I saw it advertised like a couple months ago. And then suddenly I played it and I was just like, wow. And I'm recommending it to everybody. Everyone should, if you like real time strategy games, kind of like Homeworld, but you like a little bit more. I strongly recommend this game. Did, has it led any fights eh, among? I mean, you play it with other people at Silicon Knights. I, I just, I just got it before I came down here. Okay. So, but it might. Because <laughs> well, you know, it's so much about you know crossing and double crossing and deception and I mean just forming coalitions with people, stabbing them in the back and. I, I haven't, like I haven't done that. I haven't, I haven't done enough of that yet. But I, I love that stuff. That's the best. That's I heard you good. had a game to finish. What the hell are we talking about <laughs> this for? Um, and then also at AOU, I played the new Samurai Showdown, the 3D one. You got Dennis's eye. Oh, are you Dennis a Samurai Showdown fan? I'm a huge. Uh, Samurai apparently, they still fan. play okay. Samurai Showdown 2 at. We do. We, we Samurai won. Showdown 2 put her there. Oh, I one of my favorite of games of all time. It is my favorite fighting game of all. Yeah. time. Yeah. Wow. Love yeah. Common ground. Welcome to the hardcore fighting game show. Hey, Sean rolls with that. I played all that. Dennis rolls with Sam Show. That's right. And that's about all I've had time for. It's good choices. I love. Haven't it. you been playing anything else at the around the office uh, there? Like, yeah, there's uh, been a few other games that I can't talk about. Yeah, yeah. Anything yeah. with uh, made you feel like you might be going crazy or anything like that? When we create something, we always see it as a, I guess, a world and not a singular title. So by definition, everything we do pretty much is like that. So uh, if you were to say. Do you have a lot of ideas in mind, and have you thought about uh, in depth about where you take Eternal Darkness? And the answer would be absolutely yes. I think I think there's a lot of you know potential there. Um, I think it, it, you know we'd really have to really think about how do we evolve something in, you know because we talked about sequelitis, and I think the one of the biggest mistakes you can do is repeat upon the same things that you did before 
And at the same time, you got to keep true to your mythology or to your, your creation. So doing that's extremely challenging. And, and so, uh, but yeah, I think that would be, well, I know it would be awesome. Anything with insanity? That's a hot rumor. Insanity like, effects, that, that, maybe. That's a hot rumor. That one. There's a lot of hot rumors out there. I, I, I wish, hot I wish, I, I wish I could, I wish I could talk about the games <laughs> we're, we're making. Um, you know, at some at some point, you know, I, there's probably not. There's so many things we could talk about. Talk Can you about. give us a word that makes no sense uh, out of context, but when we hear about it, we'll be like, "That's what he was talking about." I'm not going to leave you in the dark eternally. <laughs> oh, no, I, can't, I can't talk about it. Sorry, guess. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We tried. So I realize that there's a lot of press uh, having to do with the creators of this proposed uh, Kickstarter that wasn't covered in this video that only covered the original game and the press and responses to uh, Eternal Darkness. But I, I did find it interesting that I ran across a lot of people during the during the course of the Kickstarter campaign that uh, that was pretty much their only knowledge of uh, Eternal Darkness uh, and its creators was the original game and so uh, everything that uh, had happened since that game up to the point of the Kickstarter was just uh, a big blank of knowledge for them that they got to get a, uh, a rapid crash course uh, education on uh, via message boards and, and the internet and Twitter etc. Uh, and podcasts and videos. Uh, so I get it. There's a lot more to talk about in terms of uh, press and etc. Why this Kickstarter didn't happen. But uh, uh, that's that's for another time. Uh, right now, I just wanted to look at the response to Eternal Darkness and uh, the desire for the sequel uh, of Eternal Darkness and, and maybe uh, just kind of remember that feeling and that train of thought. Uh, uh, right there. I got some future videos planned. I've kind of been making notes and gathering footage and thinking about things for a long time. So um, uh, the next one I really plan to, let's talk about that initial Shadow of the Eternals Kickstarter. Uh, Shadow of the Eternals Crowdfunder uh, that initially came out and what the initial design was of that. Coming up next time on Dad's Basement, Episode 3, uh, Part 3, um, Chapter 2. We founded Precursor Games July 2012. Okay, so you guys are part of that June layoff period. So we are proud to announce Shadow of the Eternals. It's a wonderfully strong community. That's one of the toughest things about starting a company, is finding people that you can wholeheartedly rely on. Mm. Is uh, Mr. Dyack involved? In some way, he is involved, yes. Wow. The industry, as I see it right now, is upside down. Dennis Dyack wants people's money. Right. So we need your support to help make this dream come true. I hope you like what you see here. We have a report of fire in the building in the deli of the MGM.